Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stacy Kleesh. I am representing the AIA New Jersey Public Awareness Committee today. Today is uh, the first webinar in our new series of webinars created for uh, helping users understand design changes in the post-pandemic world. Our first event today is the design of multifamily buildings. I'm excited to welcome our speakers, Dean Marchetto and Dave Minow. This course, oh, excuse me, it's only approved for one uh, learning unit, not two learning units, but uh, this is approved with AIA Continuing Education. You will be receiving one credit if you are an architect member and complete the survey and participate in the full hour. You'll be re receiving the survey uh, after the program is over. The course description, the design of multifamily buildings in a post-pandemic world. In this live interactive course, two leading architect experts in the design of multifamily housing discuss recent trends in their work as a result of the current COVID-19 pandemic. Dean Marchetto, FAIA professional planner and Dave Minow, AIA professional planner, present changes in the way their buildings are being designed to protect the health of the inhabitants and reduce the likelihood of germ transmission. These industry leaders also discuss how the virus has impacted their professional practices and what long-term impacts they see to their firm going into the future. Today's learning objectives include how social distancing will impact building floor plans and amenity spaces, how corridors and sidewalk dimensions will be affected post-pandemic, what changes will occur to unit sizes, home office learning, and outdoor spaces post-pandemic, how common circulation will be affected, such as number of elevators and parking spaces post-pandemic. Dean Marchetto, FAIA professional planner, is the founding principal of Marchetto Higgins Stevie Architects, established in 1981 in Hoboken and expanded to Jersey City in 2016. MHS is an award-winning architecture planning and urban design firm that specializes in downtown mixed-use buildings, TODs, and redevelopment projects. Dean is a licensed architect and planner and a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. He's an active member of the American Planning Association, the Urban Land Institute, the Congress of New Urbanism, New Jersey Future, and serves as a long-standing commissioner on the Hudson County Construction Board of Appeals. Dean has also served on the Hudson County Public Arts Commission. Dean's design philosophy is based upon understanding a new building's relationship to its surrounding context, and in many cases, the architectural heritage of its location, especially in an existing downtown. Dean has built his 35-person firm around this principle. Weaving new buildings into an existing urban context presents a rich dialogue between old and new design to create vibrant, familiar urban spaces. This idea generated an architectural style that has provided the new face for Hoboken's incredible revitalization. Marchetto Higgins CV Architects includes the Albany, clients include the Albanese Organization, Bijou Properties, Kushner Real Estate Group, the Kushner Companies, the Rockefeller Group, the Roseland Property Company, Hearts Mountain, Russo Development, Toll Brothers, Fields Development, China Construction of America, Iron State Development, Penn Pinto Properties, and Mill Creek Residential. Dean, thank you for being with us today. Dave Minow, AIA Professional Planner, is President and a Principal at Minow and Wasco Architects and Planners. Mr. Minow specializes in private sector large mixed-use redevelopment, including TODs and projects that have significant residential components. Many of his projects reflect client relationships that span more than 15 years, including Roseland Properties, RXR, the Bazudo Group, and Mill Creek Residential. Minnow and Wasco currently are working on sustainable redevelopment projects in the following cities, Jersey City, Hoboken, Stamford, Morristown, Somerville, Park Ridge, Asbury Park, Bayonne, and Harrison. Most of these commissions were obtained by partnering with project developers and competing for RFP base sites. Mr. Minow has deep experience in obtaining regulatory approvals for large scale development and becomes involved in the architectural design of a project at the early stages of a concept. Minow and Wasco offer their clients quality design, cost effective detailing and timely services. The firm has a staff of over 85 professionals who are experienced in all forms of residential and light frame construct uh, commercial construction 
with offices in Lambertville and Newark, New Jersey. Mr. Minow has his Master's of Architecture degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a Master's of Business Administration from the Wharton School. He is active in many professional groups, including the Land Use Institute and the Congress of New Urbanism. He's volunteered his professional services to Habitat for Humanity. And I'm participating today as moderator. I am a representative of the Public Awareness Committee, as I had mentioned. I'm a past president of New Jersey AIA and the Architects League of Northern New Jersey. Thank you all for being here today and let's get started with our program. AIA New Jersey's post-pandemic design webinar series is developed for developers, build business owners, facility managers, operators, realtors, and users to assist them in understanding facility design changes that can be anticipated in our post-pandemic world. Each webinar will focus on a different building business type and feature a panel of architects experienced in that sector. For additional webinars in this series, uh, participants can use this link that you will receive uh, when you receive the survey and you can register for these following events. So after today's multifamily buildings, we have healthcare design in a post-pandemic world on November 5th at the same time, restaurant retail and commercial business design on November 19th at the same time, school and daycare design in a post-pandemic world on December 3rd at the same time, and contract interior design in a post-pandemic world on December 17th at the same time. We hope you will join us for any sectors that align with your business interests. And for our architect members, please join us for the whole series. Oh, all right, uh, Dave, you are up. Okay, I'll try to share my screen here. I hope you can see the screen. Yes. I'm Dave Minow with Minow and Wasco Architects and Planners. And first of all, I want to say uh, my sympathies to anyone in the audience who has had family or friends or coworkers experience the negative effects of COVID-19. It's a terrible plague that's uh, come upon us and, uh, you know, we, we would like to say when this is over, it's over, but you go to the name COVID-19 and you wonder where were COVID-1 through 18, and we suspect from the CDC that there will be more pandemics in the future. That's why I think we're really looking at this as a topic that's going to have continuing value to help protect our clients and the general public. So um, I'd like to talk about uh, several topics here, uh, th three of which we, we think are um, going to be continuing uh, throughout uh, the next part of our careers. Uh, the first is social distancing. The second is work from home. And the third is no touch sanitizing. And as you Heard from Stacy, we're really trying to apply these principles to multifamily housing. So the first and maybe most difficult for us is social distancing. And this comes, the, the pinch point in multifamily buildings, of course, are the corridors. And corridors are designed typically today at a five to six foot width. And that certainly isn't considered social distancing. But when you talk to developers in particular who build these projects about widening corridors, they gag on that notion because it adds so much cost to the construction to do 10 or 12 foot wide corridors that it would make most pro projects not, not feasible. So we need to th think about some new ideas and one of the um, things that we're considering is um, potential changes in improved HVAC in the corridors so that we can have greater air changes within those spaces. Another might be considering one-way circulation. And in most of the buildings we work on, this is a very difficult proposition. 
but there are some projects where this may be a viable option. Uh, of course, enforcement of people going one way is another whole issue. If they're closer to an elevator bank by turning left instead of following the one way to the right, people generally take the shortest path. So this is a very, very difficult issue and one that we're still uh, trying to think through. Um, larger elevators and stairways are another uh, potential pinch point in projects. We find that today in existing projects, people are using the stairs a great deal more because they don't want to be in an elevator and generally the stairs are free from other people. Um, and how do we distance within a smaller elevator? Amenity spaces also, this is where people gather in these communities and these are photographs from a project we did called Vermella Union for the Russo Development Corporation. And the developers here, uh, I think, even though this was designed pre-COVID, really had a notion of keeping distance between different setting areas and wider circulation areas within the amenity spaces. So this project actually is a pretty good example of where we would like to continue to, to design to. Outdoor amenity spaces are very important right now to people. Um, rooftop decks, of course, have been very popular and we see now uh, developers wanting to expand this type of amenity uh, and then winterize them. Um, you know, we, we see a need for people wanting to be outside in the wintertime. So figuring out ways to enclose these spaces and potentially even heat them um, is a is a design task for us. Outdoor game areas. This is uh, the Irby project in Harrison that we did, and it already has a great deal of outdoor uh, games and amenity spaces, as well as uh, the obvious things of, of grilling and uh, fire pits in the evening. But people are gravitating to these outdoor areas to work in, and we definitely want to see greater use of, and more Wi-Fi coverage in these areas so people feel comfortable to work outside. Uh, gym spaces, again, uh, the top photo is the Vermella Union project and equipment there is fairly well spaced out. Uh, here's a stop, stop gap measure of putting uh, plexiglass sheeting in between treadmills. But a lot of the social distancing in rec facilities today is really occurring through scheduling, through a scheduling app through the building management so that fewer people are allowed in the gym space at any given point in time. So it's really being handled through scheduling. Larger private terraces and outdoor balconies. We were moving away from balconies in particular in many of our urban projects, but now we're seeing a call for even greater and larger balcony spaces. Uh, people would like to step out of their unit in a private outdoor space, again, and, and work and socialize, eat, those types of things. Um, this is a project on the bottom right that we're planning in Persephone, and we're already increasing the balcony sizes in the early design phases to accommodate more outdoor space. And social distancing and building services, uh, larger package rooms and mail rooms, separate entries for delivery personnel. As you know, um, Amazon and other uh, FedEx and other delivery services are just going to be increasing as uh, physical shopping stops, and it's already quite an issue. So we really need to plan for this. Uh, I talked about the amenity reservation system and virtual apartment tours. You know, marketing today is becoming a virtual experience. Not as many people are coming and walking through uh, model units and looking at the project before they, before they lease. Many of the leases are taken virtually. Here's an example in our Irby Harrison project of uh, larger spaces within a mail area. They've tended to be in more cubicle spaces that are fully enclosed. Here we have some outdoor access and fairly wide spaces between 
uh, the actual mailboxes within the spaces. This brings us to the second topic, and I know Dean is going to talk a great deal about this, so I'm going to spend less time, but um, we're starting to see the increase in size in floor plans from all the way from studios to three bedroom units. And the trend had been smaller units, but we're slightly increasing or finding ways within the existing square footage to create uh, great uh, work areas within the units places where people can spend several hours uh, working online and feel comfortable doing that rather than having a computer on their lap you know, on a couch. Uh, work at home also comes into play with the common spaces within the buildings. And here are some creative ideas where within the common areas we can create private work pods. Um, down in the lower left, this is a pretty ingenious idea of using uh, old ski gondolas and repurposing them as private work areas so that you can go in and close the door and uh, work and make phone calls for a couple hours outside of your uh, unit where you live. And uh, the pods up in the upper right are also a unique uh, idea. Also, you know, work at home, many people want the ability to really have professional equipment that would help them make uh, presentations for their businesses. And we're seeing uh, dedicated small conference rooms with uh, great presentation technology there and webcams and smart boards that people can use uh, to do an excellent presentation as they would be able to do within their own, own office space. And this would be by reservation only. Um, Stronger internet is, is a need that's gonna just continue both uh, indoors and outdoors. And um, I, I mentioned the outdoor earlier, but this is gonna be every, every space within the building really needs to have increased stronger high-speed internet. So the next area, the third area that we wanted to talk about is no touch sanitizing. And building management now, uh, in many places, cleaning crews, both in the public areas and in private spaces, are using ultraviolet to clean. Uh, we had one client that was looking at giving as a moving gift uh, these uh, attractive table ultraviolet lights that you could put in your living room and turn on at night to sanitize the space. They're about 100 hours. Um, but ultraviolet is becoming a, a, a cleaning technique along with uh, uh, all the heavy duty cleaning that goes on already. This is a picture of an induct um, mechanical uh, ultraviolet light that could be used uh, within ductwork that's servicing uh, common spaces within the building in the club rooms and the gym areas. And as the air passes through the duct, it's sanitized through the ultraviolet light within the duct. Also, no touch entry features, entry to elevators, elevators controlled by apps, um, the simple mechanical hand tools that uh, open a latch, um, uh, entry systems that work on an app to a front door. And then this is a holographic on the lower right, a holographic no touch system for elevators that actually pro projects the uh, floor that you wanna go to and you, you actually touch the air, but not the button. A pretty in interesting idea. Uh, here's an elevator system that uses a pedal system. So you're not using your hands, both on the outside, on the lower right, you would tap with your foot, whether you wanna go up or down. And then within the elevator, uh, the pedals to control the floors and the opening and closing of doors. And then uh, public restroom areas are always problematic. Today we think twice about when we go into a public restroom and there's no great solution, but we're seeing greater distance between fixtures, more space within the floor plan of, of the um, restroom and potentially higher ceilings that will allow for greater ventilation within those spaces. So it's simply not closing off uh, toilet areas for non-use and hoping 
Uh, that'll get better when there's when the pandemic passes. But we think new design is going to call for greater space within public restrooms. So the world um, is certainly going to be a different place than what we saw at the top, where people were very, very social, especially the younger generations. Um, now the younger generations are learning to distance and um, it's, it's, it's a hard road to, to go by and we see many communities struggling with being able to distance, but we hope that can happen. So wear your mask and uh, enjoy uh, Dean's presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dave. That was terrific. Uh, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Yes, Dean, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, David. Thank you, uh, Stacy, and to the AIA for putting together a great program. Um, this has surely been a trying time for uh, folks like Dave and I who are trying to figure and stay, stay ahead of this moving target for residential design. But it's led to some new ideas and some new thinking that I think uh, ultimately will stay with us. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to present uh, my ideas uh, in three different categories, uh, three different scales, the unit, the building, and then the community scale. So first, let's just uh, start with, with the unit itself. Um, the newest thing, and I think Dave touched upon it, uh, that we're seeing, which is people working from home, remote working. And uh, it's become such a big aspect of not only uh, folks who are working in offices, but our own office. You know, more than 50% of our team is working from home. So it's become a real deal. And working for multifamily developers as clients, um, we have to figure out how to manage those projects to accommodate working from home. Um, to do that, I'm gonna just uh, show you an example of one project here. This is a project we're designing in Hoboken uh, on the corner of 12th. It's a 48 unit residential building. It has five floors, uh, four over one with the lobby on the ground floor. And as Dave had mentioned, in this particular job is designed as a wellness job. There are many aspects of this building that are designed to be COVID safe. And one of, one of the features uh, is, is a wider corridor. Not only a wider corridor, but a corridor with windows to provide fresh air. So in this, in this floor plan, you can see here, normally we would have maybe a five foot corridor, but in this case, we made uh, the car a seven feet wide. It does take away from some of the residential net square footage, but I think it makes people feel safe. Um, and then to be able to put windows in the corridor and allow fresh air uh, it, it, it is an added feature. So when you work for developers, they usually have a, a set idea of what a, a, a unit would look like, either a studio or one or a two bedroom unit. They have a precise formula, usually for marketing, that tells them uh, the best unit that they can put on the market here is a certain size. And in this case, I'm going to show you an example of a pre and post COVID unit, which is a one bedroom unit. Uh, typically before uh, the pandemic, we um, would design a one bedroom unit like this. this is a typical urban apartment unit, 30 feet deep, 25 feet wide. It's 740 square feet. It has a C-shaped kitchen at the entry off the corridor, a living and dining room that's combined, a bedroom, a walk-in closet, and a bathroom. So within this same 740 square feet, we've reconfigured that unit to accommodate uh, the, the pandemic concerns. The pr primary concern is how do you create a space in that small unit for a workspace? 
So what we've done is we've pushed the kitchen forward. We've made it an L-shaped kitchen, so the space for the living, dining, and kitchen is still rather large space. And then behind the kitchen, we were able to create an alcove, a separate working area. In this case, it's seven foot six by seven foot oh. Um, and that working area is associated with the apartment entry and a little bit of a corner like a vestibule before you enter the unit. We're able to, um, <clears throat> of course the walls are designed to line up, create a pocket door here that actually separates this vestibule working alcove from the rest of the unit. So if one, one member of a household is working privately uh, and somebody gets a visitor, uh, you're able to keep this door closed here and create a separate zone in the residential area. Um, the other thing that uh, allows you to do here is to maybe uh, put in a, a package stand. So if a package comes in or you come in with your keys, your wallet, your phone, uh, and then have a UV light associated with that where you can put these, these items down and they can be sanitized. You could even have a light underneath the stand and you can put your shoes there and the shoes can be um, you know, under the UV light and getting decontaminated. And then you come into the apartment here and come out uh, and close off. Uh, in the event that you were gonna have food delivered and a lot of folks in urban apartment buildings, they do that. They don't cook as much as they do in suburban homes. So, um, they order food and a delivery person can actually come in, be buzzed in, leave the package here, and then, uh, and then uh, close the door and leave. And there would never be an interaction between the delivery person and, 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 and the resident. Um, another thing uh, that people don't do often in residential buildings uh, is allow fresh air. We have windows that open, they're required by code, but more often than not, people either turn on the air conditioning or the heat and they leave the windows closed. Um, so one, one of the things that we're thinking and we're using in this building is an energy recovery ventilation system. It's a small unit, size of a toaster oven, goes up in, in the ceiling area above a closet or a bathroom in the drop ceiling area with two five inch ducts that can either be ducted into a vertical shaft to the roof or through the wall of the exterior. And this ERV unit, uh, it, um, it allows fresh air to come in, it gets transferred, the heat gets transferred to clean air from the dirty air or stale air being removed. So you don't lose heat during this, but you are getting fresh air without taking in the cold air. It gets transferred inside the unit through a radiator system. Um, those, uh, and then of course, uh, if you have the opportunity, people do like private open space more often than not, as Dave said, uh, we're seeing balconies come back. So to be able to provide an outdoor space where you can be outside uh, is, is a beneficial addition to a, a residential unit in an urban area. So the ERV system here, this is the box. It, it has uh, two intakes and two, and, and two ex exchange, exhaust exchange air uh, ports. You can see the dimensions here. It's, uh, it's 12 inches deep. It's about 19 inches wide. It sits up in the ceiling and it's just piped through these ports in and out of the building. The air gets exchanged inside the unit and so the heat is recovered. So you're able to get fresh air without, um, without losing the heat. Now, the, that particular idea, uh, we tested it out uh, in studio apartments and two bedrooms as well. This is how it could work uh, in a studio apartment. This is a typical studio um, that is uh, 500 square feet, again, 30 feet deep, 17 feet wide. Uh, Pre-COVID, there would be a galley kitchen, a bathroom, and then a common living dining. Uh, and what we've done here is we've turned the kitchen uh, along the side wall of the unit here uh, and created a vestibule or a and a working alcove seven feet by seven feet behind the bathroom again secured from the rest of the apartment with a, uh, a pocket door and a package stand uh, to be able to decontaminate packages on the way in um, again you know an erv system located above above the drop ceiling and 
when, whenever possible to provide an outdoor balcony. Developers that we work for often tell us that if they're gonna rent a studio apartment or a one bedroom apartment, there's a certain size that you want to create. So if you um, uh, have a studio unit that is for the market that we're in, uh, is to be, to be 500 square feet, you can't just add the alcove to the unit and make it 580 square feet because there's only so much uh, a renter will pay in the market for that unit. So to be able to create an alcove within a unit that doesn't increase in size is a very beneficial uh, idea for a developer. And then this is just an example how the same thing could work uh, in a two bedroom unit, bedroom on the left, bedroom on the right, living in the middle with the C-shaped kitchen pre-COVID, post-COVID, push the kitchen forward and put the alcove in the back connected to the exterior, uh, the exterior entry uh, on the corridor. And of course the closet is in there as well, the coat closet. Uh, and then uh, the, next, the next scale uh, coming out of the unit and looking at the building as a whole, uh, looking at buildings in general, uh, that would be the scale I would like to uh, talk about here. Um, what we, uh, what we anticipate that there will be an increased number of smaller buildings in the future. Shorter buildings, maybe buildings uh, four stories or less so people can walk up to their units and not have to get into the elevator. As Dave mentioned, the uh, elevator is a pinch point. Um, and so people would maybe prefer not having to go through the elevator and walk ups uh, can only be so tall. Um, this is a building we, we completed for Mill Creek uh, Residential uh, in Morristown, I guess uh, two years ago before COVID. But what was interesting about this building is it's a double loaded corridor building. So there's a main entrance, an elevator, you come up to your floor, you walk down the corridor, apartments on the right, on the left. But it just so happens that the apartments on the lowest floor actually could have a separate exterior entrance. So people who are very concerned about not going into the lobby or the elevator could actually enter their units directly. So a residential unit could have two entries, one off the corridor and one from the street uh, to create more social distancing. In this floor plan, you could see such a unit. This is the corridor, units on both sides, typical unit here with a living room, kitchen, bathroom and bedroom has a separate entrance that comes up, a little porch, and then you can come into the unit directly from the exterior. Pre-COVID, uh, urban areas and downtown areas, there was a trend moving towards more bicycles uh, and less cars, less parking, and it was a very healthy trend. People were taking more mass transit and living on train stations transit oriented developments were popping up. But recently with COVID, people have, uh, we find have been trying to avoid those, those crowded subways and buses and, um, and, and, and we're actually using their cars more. We, we hope this trend reverts back to where it was before COVID. But in the meanwhile, um, while we're not using um, uh, mass transit and, and bikes, uh, people using their cars, what we have found is that that we need to provide, at least on a temporary basis, more parking in those buildings because people are driving. I know for myself here in Hoboken, um, people drive, uh, driving into the city has increased. People who are wor working still in Manhattan are driving in, they're not taking the train and the bus, and therefore when they get back to their uh, unit, they're going to need a parking space. So parking is uh, increased and in, in garages that have a 13 foot ceiling, we're installing uh, in a number of projects, these um, semi-automated uh, parking systems where you can pull into a parking space and your car is automatically lifted up and another parking space could, could occur below. So you can actually double the amount of parking in your garage with systems like this. Uh, companies like, um, I guess Klaus Parking, um, 
Hawk Plus are two companies that I know of that uh, provide these. There's another company called City Lift that does it as well. Uh, these these uh, contraptions here, they cost about $13,000 per space. So you can get a, effectively a second level of a garage in your building by installing these and not having to build another floor, as long as you have a 13 foot clear ceiling. Here's um, an example of a project that we just completed in Hoboken with just such a system. The parking stackers are behind these doors and when you pull up, you can operate this system on your phone. The door will open, the car goes in, and then you can leave and the car gets lifted up to the second level. Outdoor space, very important in buildings. Um, people are, as we mentioned with balconies, looking for more in outdoor space. And one source of outdoor space in urban buildings is certainly the roof. Um, and in this case, this is in a, a building that we, uh, we designed here in Hoboken for Toll Brothers. And in this case, it's a condo. And if you were to buy a condo in the building, let's say on the second or third or fourth floor, as an a la carte extra, you could buy an outdoor deck, a private outdoor deck up on the roof that uh, has its own private entrance. It has gas, it has electric, it has plumbing, and you could have your own little uh, private uh, space outdoors up on the roof. This is very popular happening all over uh, in, in most of our urban buildings. This is where we'd like to get off the elevator up on the roof. The roof area is paved with pavers. And then here's the private entrance right to your own private, private deck area outdoors. And then one more aspect that we found this piece of hardware that was very interesting. It looks more like it's commercial hardware, but you can do door pulls here without touching the handles and you can push with your arm and not have to use your bare skin on your hand. Okay, um, high rise buildings. One of, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we're finding in high rise buildings, of course, is uh, more elevators, bigger corridors and more elevators. But in high rise buildings, communities like the one here at 180 Morgan in Jersey City, outdoor space is at a premium. And with buildings this big, even greater outdoor space is required. This is a building that I, it has about 400 apartments in it and um, it has a theater on the ground floor, but it's, it's a podium building. Um, and, and the building is set up uh, with a parking garage and a base, and then it steps back into a tower. And, and what's, what we wanted to show here is that in this particular case, it's an L-shaped podium base. The tower is in the center, which leaves two separate and distinct outdoor spaces, one on this side of the building and one that you can't see in this rendering. Um, but let me see if I could uh, stop my screen share for a moment and show you a print. Yeah. This here is a 3D print of that building, 184 Morgan Street. And what I wanted to show you is here, the tower pops up and there are two separate and distinct outdoor spaces associated with the building. So that, so that you could have a passive area on one side and active area on the other side and an amenity floor, which allows you to separate your amenities and allow people to uh, be in two separate areas, you know, creating more of a social distancing effect for the amenities. Okay, this uh, next image, let me get here. Yeah, this is a photograph of the building as it's being constructed. And in this view, you can see here on the podium, the outdoor decks, one on the left, which is more active, and one on the right, which would be more passive. The eighth floor of this building, which is this podium level, is the amenity floor. So all the indoor amenities spill out onto the rooftop amenities that can be separated on either side of the building. And this is an overall plan. We worked with RKLA landscape architects. This is the footprint of the building. And here you can see active and passive areas. And even on the passive side, there, 
like David mentioned, there are separate individual areas so that people can spread out. Okay, and then the final uh, scale for this presentation is at the neighborhood scale. And what we're seeing here, um, we expect over time uh, that to see more growth in decentralized urban centers, mid-sized cities and suburban towns and, and cities, rather than more centralized big cities like Philadelphia or, or New York City. Um, we expect more growth in, in, in the mid-sized cities. Um, and there's going to be a lot of pressure in the future to develop more housing in suburban areas of New Jersey, northern New Jersey, all over New Jersey, in downtowns. And I expect that there's going to be a, um, a conflict where developers and folks are gonna to wanna to move out of the city and move into suburban areas where there is more, uh, more open space. And um, there probably will be a resistance in those communities to say, hey, you know, we're dense enough. We don't want any more development. So I see um, battle lines being drawn over the next five to 10 years as, as we uh, approach these issues at planning board and city council meetings. Um, but outdoor space in urban areas is very important. This is a, a former street uh, in Hoboken uh, called uh, Garden Street that uh, has been closed and made into a common area, a pedestrian area, a muse, let's say. And on one day a week in this particular one, uh, we have a farmer's market and, and we're finding that in cities that we work in, this is happening more and more outdoor spaces in the community. People are gonna to wanna to feel safe and have more spaces to be outside. And um, on even a bigger scale, uh, we're working on a rather large project with Pelly, Clark Pelly Architects on this uh, project in uh, Jersey City. Uh, this project is one, two, three, four, five, six, elevated former train embankments. There used to be a train that came through from, from uh, Western New Jersey through along this elevated embankment down to the Hudson River. And the developer, which is the Albanese group, is working with the city right now to design a project where they would build the development on one of the blocks, reconnect all of these blocks and create a continuous park along the uh, top level of these embankments. Um, sort of like the uh, like the High Line, but a more a more uh, uh, let's say it's a wider it's a wider footprint, and um, it would have a specific development on one of the blocks. Uh, this is the development block, which is the easternmost block, and in here you can see there's a development of two towers that will be proposed up on top of the first block. And then the park, which would be a continuous park on the other eight blocks, would allow folks on one end of downtown to go up on the embankment and cross over these embankments to a green space and move from block to block without having to uh, navigate through traffic. Um, but the idea is to be able to create more open space and to use these kinds of places for more open space in urban areas that are very dense. And, um, and then once you get to the leading edge, you can step back down or you can go across the front ro uh, road, which is Marin Boulevard, and then continue to the Hudson River. These are some views of what this could look like. Uh, the building on the pr first block, and then you can see this trail that moves through all, all of the other blocks in downtown, elevated above the city street. And uh, the trail itself would have different spaces. This is very much, I'm sure you're, you're, you're all familiar with the High Line, very much like the High Line through Jersey City. And another view, uh, you can see here uh, below the building, remnants of the old uh, stone embankment, which will be preserved on all the blocks. And then you can see here the two towers. And one of the things that uh, we're finding that people like is they have more views more open space. So we're designing apartments that have bigger windows. The more open outdoors you can bring into your unit with larger windows, the, uh, the, the safer people feel and it's psychologically beneficial as well. 
to feel like they're uh, released and not contained inside a, a small enclosure. And then and finally, I'd like to just end on a happy note. Um, it's funny, uh, human beings are social animals and while, while we um, have lost a lot of opportunities in the last six months to go into restaurants and be social, um, Restaurants have actually spilled out onto the streets in communities all over the country. This happens to be uh, something in my neighborhood in Hoboken on my walk from the office to home. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of a line in the uh, Jurassic Park movie uh, called Life Finds a Way. Um, and in this case, I'd like to think of it as urbanism finds a way, finds a way. And here, you know, at makeshift outdoor dining, and seating right in the street. And in some ways, and in some ways, this kind of festive outdoor social gathering probably will grow, not necessarily in the future because of COVID-19, because it provides wonderful outdoor experience for people eating and socializing. And, and, and I tend to believe that some of these things that we're doing, including remote working at home, will stay with us. Um, I uh, also wanted to say that I, I spoke with uh, the director of city planning in Jersey City and asked her what she's seeing. Uh, her name is Tanya Marone. She, and, and, and she mentioned to me that you know, there's always been a complaint in Jersey City from residents about not having larger units. And, and, and so Jersey City has adopted a plan now for wider sidewalks. Most of the redevelopment plans in Jersey City require a minimum of 15 feet wide sidewalks, which is a nice, nice aspect. And she also said to me um, uh, that she hopes that this, this awakening to social distancing and COVID, COVID um, safe design will be a, uh, the next Jane Jacobs movement in planning for her. That was important to her. And I also spoke to Tony Nellison. He's a, uh, a vision planner, uh, teaches at the Blaustein School at Rutgers. And, and he said that as development starts to occur in uh, rural areas, as we spread out further from the city to rural areas, it's gonna be very important that we concentrate the development in rural villages and not to subdivide into one half to one acre subdivision lots like we've been doing. And that um, those types of subdivisions have no place in a, a future uh, post pandemic future. Um, um, so back to, back to this uh, happy moment, people socializing outside in, in Jersey City and Hoboken and communities everywhere. This is a very pleasant thing to walk through on the way home. You feel like you're walking through uh, uh, an alley of restaurants and, 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 uh, and seating and tables and chairs. And in some ways, it brings this activity from inside to the outside and it's become uh, a very popular and attractive addition to the streetscape here in Hoboken. It's another one, um, very typical, you see these all over, all over the city. Uh, and that's my, that's my presentation. Um, uh, thank you for listening and I'm happy to, um, to answer any questions. Dean, we do have a question from the audience. I'll ask Dave to also turn on your microphone. Uh, before I get to that question, I wanted to ask either of you or both of you, are you feeling that um, municipalities might be receptive to sustaining the outdoor dining that we're seeing? Because I know in many uh, towns it wasn't previously allowed or they had to make special accommodations to put it in now. Well, yeah, I, I, go ahead, Dave. No, I, I, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it is here to stay. And uh, I think street planning and urban planning is going to start designing in more of these spaces from the beginning, especially when we have new development. But I think in terms of them relaxing prior regulations for outdoor dining, I think they're going to do it. I think you're going to see provisions for uh, allowing structures to carry things such as heaters over the sidewalk and out into the first part of the street to help accommodate uh, the restaurants in the future. So yep. I think it's going to become more a part of our way of life, as Dean said. 
Uh, and they also, in, in, in fact, in Hoboken, they, they have a, si a sidewalk cafe ordinance that ends uh, sometime in October and they, they extended it at least another month as, a, as an ordinance. So that is definitely happening, at least from my experience here in Hoboken. Thank you. Um, our first question today is from Joshua Zinder. Have either of you engaged or seen an increase in passive house certification and systems in the post pandemic? If so, do you think it works well? I have not, not specifically. Neither have I. Okay. Um, next question is from Richard Brandt. With COVID-19 treatments now available and vaccines in the next few months, why are we giving such great concern to designing for COVID? Okay, um, maybe I'll start off on this one. Um, I think many of the things that we've learned from COVID are things that we will carry through future, even post COVID. And, and, and in particular, working from home. It's, it's amazing to me how all of a sudden in March, one week we were all working together and then the following week we were all working separately. And many offices, including myself, my own, all of a sudden, you know, we managed to figure out how to zoom into our local computers and, um, and, and, and managed to work remotely together. And boy, a lot of folks actually have been, become more productive, uh, spending less time on the roads, making a better environment because we don't have so, as many cars on the road driving to work. That's something that I think is a positive benefit um, and that, and that will stay with us. And that maybe we won't go back um, to 100% working in the office and that maybe in the future, we'll be able to live with smaller work, work office footprints, smaller offices, less expense, lower overhead and uh, working remotely. Uh, it's, it really has been a surprise to me how successful it has become I mean, as you probably all know, going to planning boards now and city council meetings, all these public events are all happening on Zoom. And um, it's saving an, an incredible toll on the environment in terms of, of transportation. Um, and then that, that, that leads to remote working space. So if we're gonna be working more uh, after the pandemic from home, uh, we're going to need spaces. So those apartment layouts that I showed you that show the alcove in the back, that alcove is for working. However, you know, if, if, a, if a young family has a child and they need a temporary room until they move to a bigger apartment, that's a spot that a guest could stay over or a crib could be put in. So it has, it has more than one use. Um, so I, I think that some of those assets, and even fresh air, we talked about, uh, putting fresh air into the apartments. That's a healthy idea. I think something that we've learned from, from COVID about having fresh air piped into the apartments is a good thing. And it was, I believe it's, some of those things will stay with us. And I, I totally agree with Dean, especially about the work at home ideas. They're gonna stay and the mechanical fresh air ideas. And I think even the social distancing and sanitizing issues are gonna stick with us for a long time. But I think we all would be foolish to think that we're, we're free of another pandemic. And I think people who make a commitment to housing, whether it's a year lease or the purchase of a condominium or a single family home or a townhouse, they're thinking what's the future gonna be and how safe is this unit going forward over a longer period of time. So they're looking just the same way uh, several years ago, before we were very sustainable in the design of our buildings, people didn't really think too much about it, but then they began to think about, do I wanna live in a sustainable building or a non-sustainable building? And now that's become, do I wanna live in a safe environment or an unsafe environment? And it's one of the boxes that developers, or any way you look at it from a marketing standpoint, are gonna to have to check off and they're gonna to have to talk about it in their leasing offices and sales offices on how they're addressing this issue going forward. So it's, a, it's gonna stay with us for a long, 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 long time. <laughs> I'm also going to offer that I think a lot of design trends that we have seen over the years have developed out of 
either convenience for the owner or operator or out of uh, financial um, opportunity, but not always in the best interest of the user. So now I think um, where, you know, like open office plans and things like that, that people didn't really like working in that kind of environment or having hotel rooms get smaller and smaller. I've stayed in hotel rooms that felt like a cruise ship room, you know? And the hotel advertises that as like a fabulous trendy design, but when you're in there, you feel like a sardine. So I think that um, a lot of the things that COVID has triggered are things that are making people feel safer and healthier and more comfortable and more able to function as a family unit or um, you know, it allows them to live more comfortably. And so it's made us realize that maybe we were making too aggressive moves for financial benefit or convenience benefit, and that it wasn't necessarily in the best interest of the people. So I think that's another uh, effect. We have a couple more questions. Uh, Ralph Rosenberg, with the thousands of units out there, have your clients asked for renovation ideas to retain or attract new tenants post-COVID to existing spaces? Uh, the answer is yes. We've had a couple of requests to do some of the floor plan type changes that Dean uh, was showing you to create in-unit work areas. And, um, you know, they want to do it obviously with a minimum of reconstruction cost and they'll do it when a unit turns over. When someone leaves their lease, they'll come in with a crew and make some adjustments. But I think even the greater area that they're reevaluating and can really do something about are their common areas and how they reorganize those into, you know, we used to have very large open spaces and now they're being divided up into what I would call more co-working spaces uh, and a little more privacy and partitioning to uh, break those up. So. That's a big change. We're, we're seeing a lot of clients come regarding that. And then the third area would be a rooftop. And we've had some people come back and say, can we add rooftop um, space to our existing building? And that becomes a little more complicated if you haven't already brought the elevator to the roof area. Um, and because you need the handicap accessibility, and you need a two additional means of egress where your stair towers would have to come to the roof. So it's a little bit more complicated to add a roof area after the fact, but people are still desiring to do that. Dean, do you want to offer anything for that question? My only experience with that has been the roofs as well. People are coming back and making more use of their open roofs. Um, but I haven't done any interior fit up renovations post COVID since, uh, since March. Thank you. Uh, another question from Richard Brandt or two questions. If we live and work at home, what will happen to our cities, restaurants and other services in the city, mass transit systems? What will city offices be converted into? Well, that's a very interesting question and I'm glad someone brought it up. What, what we have found is is as people are working more remotely from home, the, the professional who used to get on a train and go into the city from, let's say, Chatham, Madison, one of these northern New Jersey uh, train or train oriented towns, now they're in towns. And during their lunch hour, they're no longer in the city, they're actually in their local downtown. And what we're finding is that those towns where we were losing retail shops and mom and pop shops, because of the lack of um, the lack of participation from local folks, are now already starting to see a trend towards um, more, more openings. So uh, it's great that uh, folks who are working from home are now patronizing their local shops, their local diners, their local restaurants, local stores, and so people are now uh, able to have more of a 24-hour downtown. Uh, so I think it's been very good for New Jersey in particular. Uh, that these folks who would spend their lunchtime dollars and after after uh, after work dollars right in their local town has re reinvigorated the downtown uh, in, 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 in these um, in these train oriented and transit oriented uh, suburban towns. 
I think too, um, I'm a big proponent of affordable housing and we have such a need for affordable housing. And I think there's an opportunity here. And we see some people looking at these ideas of converting failed hotels, uh, in particular in suburban locations, office buildings and other structures into affordable housing. And uh, hotels in particular are very, a very easy conversion. You just need to add a small kitchenette. The plumbing's already there. So a lot of the expense of um, converting a, a non-residential building to a residential building are already taken care of. So one of our hopes is, I mean, it's, it's a tough thing for the hospitality industry to lose hotels, but if that, if that has happened, I think to repurpose them for something that's gonna have a real benefit for society uh, would be a great thing to do. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Paul Tajlov. Although we don't wish anyone ill, have you seen a decline in purchasing units that don't have these COVID features? I have not. Uh, I see Dave shaking his head as well. <laughs> our, our business is, um, is really on the uptick right now, and it's a very positive thing for us. Um, so we haven't seen um, we haven't seen a slowdown uh, here in the New Jersey market. Um, and with regard to um, whether or not the people are buying or renting, or renting units uh, with or without, it's, there's a certain percentage of apartments that we're designing that do have these remote working areas, and there's still a majority of to traditional residential units that we're building and the, the developers and the marketing folks are, are asking for more. So I have to say, well, I haven't seen a slowdown. Okay, um, we don't have any additional questions at this time. I want, and we also are at our time limit for our presentation, so that was perfect. Uh, oh, one more thing. Any thoughts on code changes, such as do bathrooms need to get larger per code? I think the handicap requirements make the bathrooms as, as large as they really need to be. Um, and I don't see uh, any code changes on the horizon for larger bathrooms. I don't, I don't see code changes for public bathroom spaces. Um, but, but I think that, that as I mentioned in my presentation, I think public restrooms are going to have a, a larger space requirement so that people can move around without having as much uh, close contact. Yeah. And I was referring to individual apartment bathrooms. Maybe I misunderstood the question. Do you think occupant loads are going to change? They could. Um, that may be one effect that the code councils start reviewing, but I think it'll take a long time to implement that. But it may be one thing that they consider. They might have in the mechanical codes, um, I think some of the things that will, will happen are more required air changes per hour in public spaces. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated in the call. You will be receiving a follow-up survey and receiving your continuing education credit is um, related to you completing and submitting that survey, so please do that. We have recorded today's video and it will be uploaded to AIA New Jersey's YouTube channel in the future to view again or to share with uh, other people who can benefit from this content. Dean and Dave, thank you so very, very much for being a part of this today. Uh, all of your information has been so valuable and this is my second time viewing it and I learned a lot again. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Be safe.